Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Christ followers, you are given a direct and clear command in Scripture. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous. Command them to do good, not be good. That's in other parts of the Bible. Command them to do good. So you and I are expected to leverage our resources for something greater than ourselves. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines, pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us here on Today with Jeff Vines. We're in a series called Generosity. Pastor Jeff is exploring the power of giving of our time and resources and looking at the impact it can have on our communities. We're partway through this message. You can find the full message on your podcast app. But here's Pastor Jeff to finish today's message. If you want to do ultimate good, simply reflect the nature of God. Be holy for I'm holy. And the nature of God includes two things, sacrifice and generosity. At the core of God's activity to humanity, sacrifice and generosity. In fact, staggering generosity. The word generous here, very interesting word because it refers back to the heartbeat of God. It's the word eumetodotus which is a word that means liberal bounty. It's a staggering generosity. That means when you're so generous, people can't hardly believe it. It's the same word used, sorry, not the word, but the idea used in Matthew 18, where there's a king and a servant, and the servant has this incredible debt. In fact, the number used would be like you and me saying a gazillion. You know, there's really no number. The debt is so great. And he's arrogant enough to tell the king in order to borrow time to pay it back. Hey, give me time and I'll pay it back. There's no way he can pay it back. There's not enough years left in his life to pay that kind of debt. And we're told that the king who represents God, the servant represents you and me, forgives the debt. Now that is not generosity. That's staggering generosity because in that culture, what should have happened is the servant as well as his family and his family that is not even born yet, his children and his children's children would go into slavery to pay the debt. That's how it worked. God in staggering generosity forgave the debt. That is the word that describes Jesus' attitude toward you and me. And we're told that believers are to act toward others with the same generosity that God has given us. So what did God give us? His own son. And that's pretty generous. What he treasured the most, what he loved the most, what was most precious to him, he gave that away. Now here's the question. What do we treasure the most in the American West? Stuff, money and stuff. Marketers continue to tell us that we will be happy if we buy their product, right? Lust of the eyes. And there's more and more stuff coming out all the time. Don't you love the iPhones? I mean, I'm gonna sell you this, but I'm gonna make sure it's obsolete, so you have to get this one. And then I'm gonna make sure that's absolute. I got you for the rest of your life because you think you can't live without it. Christ followers, you are given a direct and clear command in Scripture. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous. Command them to do good, not be good. That's in other parts of the Bible. Command them to do good. So you and I are expected to leverage our resources for something greater than ourselves. He expects us, he expects you and me not to be average in our good deeds, like helping a lady cross the street or giving some money to the homeless, some loose change or mowing the neighbor's lawns or donating what you don't want to the church rummage sale. All of those things that we do, that's just, that's poor people good. Rich people good's different. Rich people good is taking something that you really think you can't live without and going and living without it or giving it away. When the command is given to be rich in good deeds, the message is be extravagant in good deeds. And it basically means to leverage my stuff for the sake of the world in a way that only rich people can. Because rich people have extra time and extra money. I know you don't think you do, but only 8% of the world, you know, can take Saturday and Sunday off. Only 8% of the world has Saturday and Sunday. The other 92% live from day to day. 
Vacation days, holidays, that's unfathomable to the poor, but commonplace to the wealthy. And yet the stats tell us that the more expendable time and income that you have, the less percentage you give away in service to others, the less extra time and income you have, the greater the percentage you give away in service to others. Therefore, the more you have, the less generous you become. Now, why is that true? It's amazing, and here's the answer. Pastor Jeb told you he's gonna be honest. Here's, here's the answer for us, you and me. It's because once we become rich, we've got competing options. We now have the means to use airline travel points and go see the world, to own a second home and a getaway, to drive over to Las Vegas and gamble every weekend, to go to Palm Springs and play golf, to go to the beach. We got more means now. Rich people have so much extra time and stuff that they have to think about, what am I, how am I gonna enjoy myself? God says, the problem is your thinking's all wrong. You're asking the question, how can I fill up my extra time by doing something that's going to bring me pleasurable satisfaction and enjoyment? God says you have extra time and extra resources for a reason. And I want you to ask yourself, how can you leverage your time and resources for something other than you? How can you be rich in good deeds? Now, let's let's take a pause just quickly. Let me push back here. This is hard, hard to take, but people are going to say, Jeff, I, I don't have extra money and extra time. You're wrong. I don't have those things that you're saying that I have. Well, can I tell you why? According to the latest Forbes report, just honestly, can I tell you why? One, you're living above your means. Because you think you deserve everything you want. And you live and get things that you don't have the money to get. And so you put yourself in bondage and made your debt because you think you deserve all these things, says Forbes. Second, you can't distinguish between a want and a need. You can't distinguish between what you want and what you need. And as a result, you're in debt up to your ears because you've been sucked into a world system governed by Satan that is meant to distract you from the ultimate goal. He's got you. But where a Christ follower is concerned, our simple motto, and this is where the epiphany came in. This is it right here. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And I have come to believe that this is the very reason that God instituted the tithe. It's not just about the temple tax or provision for the Levites who operated the temple or about simply meeting the needs of people or the poor. God, when he institutes any precept, it's to save you from yourself. And he instituted the tithe because most people will say, boy, I really want to give, but I just don't know how I can pinch another dime. Well, that's been the problem from the beginning. We claim that God provides everything, but we live as though he gives us very little. God has his mission in the world, his kingdom, which is eternal. We have our mission in the world, our kingdom, which is temporary. He institutes the tithe to pull us back into his mission. And like all precepts, it brings life. Now, I got to do this quickly, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because some of you are new and some of you need a refresher course. What are you talking about the tithe? Well, the tithe is used all through the Bible. And you go beyond the tithe when you get to the New Testament. Here's what it means quickly. Number one, tithe means 10, tenth or 10%. It's used 41 times in the Bible. It's not an obscure biblical concept. It's a common concept with common understanding. It means tithe, it means or describes the immediate gift of 10% of your income at your first opportunity. It's off the top, not off what's left over. In the Old Testament, they didn't have monetary system like we do. So what they would do is bring the tithes of grain and cattle and money. And in Deuteronomy 14, if a person lived so far away from the temple and it was a major hassle to get all the tithes and the cattle and the crops to the temple, this is what they were instructed to do. Immediately convert the cattle and crops to cash and bring the money to the temple. Why why would you do that? Because God knows the human heart. If you withhold it, you're going to run out of money sometime. You say, oh, I got the tithe bag over there. Let's, Let's raid God's money. So there's great wisdom and do it immediately. It's the idea of first fruits, not what's left over. It belongs to God. And the tithe is off the top of what God places into your hand. Not after you pay your bills, not after you pay your credit card. 
off the top of what God places in your hands. Because God and his purposes in the world come first. Proverbs 3, you knew I was going to read this sooner or later. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. It's the first tenth. It's the very first fruits. It's the very best of the very best. Tithing is also a universal principle. For those of you who are Bible scholars and you're still leaning toward, oh, this is an Old Testament tax to the nation of Israel. Jeff is kind of stretching it here. Just remember, the tithe did not originate with the law. It did not stop with the law. It was established before the law. It extends far beyond the law. Abraham, hundreds of years before Moses, brought tithes to Melchizedek, Cain and Abel, all the way back in Genesis 4-4. We're told Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel, and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So the assumption is that Abel brought the best of the best, while Cain brought was what, what was left over. They both gave something, but one gave the best, one brought whatever's left over. And as I've said before, G. Campbell Morgan calls that sacrilege. You and I think of sacrilege, of taking something that is sacred and using it in a profane way. But there's another way to define sacrilege. That is taking something that means absolutely nothing to you or little to you and giving that to God. Leftovers. Tithing is a thermometer of spiritual vitality. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, that your money is going to go toward that which you value the most. If you value the kingdom of God and Jesus' work in the world, your budget sheet's going to reveal that. Can't hide it. Tithing is the starting place for New Testament giving. The starting place, because both the Old and the New Testaments use two words, tithe and offering. What's the distinction? Well, the distinction is a tithe is what belongs legally to God off the top of everything. It means 10. The first 10% of everything God places into your hand belongs to God. And that's why he says in Malachi, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me, but you ask, how do we rob you in tithes and offerings? The offering, the tithe is the 10th of your total income. The offering is what you give above and beyond that, which means that a lot of people have never given an offering because they've never given a tithe. And then in the New Testament, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So the assumption is that someone who loves the kingdom of God is going to sow generously so that they might reap a great harvest. Here's the point. The tithe is the poor man's cross. This is the epiphany. When people say, I can't afford to give, here's what they're really saying. I can't afford to give without burdening myself. But you can't bear Christ's burden for the world without burdening yourself. Galatians 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You can't bear anybody's burden without taking some of that burden onto yourself. Jesus' message. Look at the burdens of the world. You need to give until some of the burdens of the world are falling on you. That's what Jesus did. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus means... At least to some degree, bearing the burdens of the world and taking them upon your shoulder. No greater burden exists in humanity than helping those who are far from God come near. That's why the purpose of one and all church, where God has called you, is generosity with a C. Because it is our mission to transform this city. And to bring people far from God near to God. To bring businessmen and women far from God near to God. Yes, we want to be rich in good deeds. So we have God's pantry to meet the monetary needs of people. Food, clothing, shelter, counseling for addiction, whatever it is. But primarily we exist. To help people far from God come near to God, which means there is no greater investment that you could make. As I said before, God gave me a wonderful gift called anxiety disorder. Because now I don't care about my kingdom. My kingdom takes too much energy and effort. And I'm too old now for that. I just want to build His kingdom now. Don't care if anybody ever knows my name. Don't care who knows me or who doesn't. What I do care about is when I leave this place, that whoever comes after me has a great ministry to continue to transform this city 
for the cause of Christ. And so that's my question to each of you. What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with everything God has given you? Please don't misunderstand. Vacations are good. Good golf clubs are fine. But it's the same thing I've always asked you. Do you spend as much in the kingdom of God than you do on yourself? Do you know that we are told, the Forbes report that I mentioned tells us, this is amazing to me. Now, this is recent. 78% of Americans live above their means. 78. 60% of the 78% make over $100,000 a year. So you're making a, over $100,000 a year and you still don't have enough. And 40% of the 60% live paycheck to paycheck. But then the Forbes magazine tells us why. One, lifestyle inflation. As our, incre as our income increases, we spend more. Rather than increased income, investing more in the kingdom of God, we just keep spending more and more and getting everything we're told we have to have. You look around at your life, I promise you, what you need is, <laughs> oh man, my goodness. You, most of the stuff you have, you don't need. And that's why your garage is filled with junk. <laughs> ah. And the second thing Forbes says, because of social pressures. Significance is tied to the external look. So you believe the lie that you've got to have nice clothes, not just nice clothes, but designer. They got to have the name on it. You can't just, have, I mean, you can't just have a purse. You got to have Louis Vuitton. You know, you, you can't just have clothes. You got to have Travis Mathis. <laughs> I don't even know what the good stuff is. I just wear what my wife buys at the Goodwill store. And I look okay. <clears throat> But I do spend money, as my buddy Rick will tell you, on the best golf stuff. That's what I save my money for. So I take a good look at my bank account. Am I investing in the kingdom? Is it my real and true love? And then finally, we're told that again, Americans cannot distinguish between needs and wants. You know, a need is food. A want is fast food. And it's gotten expensive. And as I said before, it might be fast, but it ain't food. A need is clothing. But a want is designer clothing. And now we're buying them for our kids. We don't want some parent to think my kid is wearing something that's less than. Oh, what a great thing to teach them early in their lives. A need is recreation. I do believe there is a place for recreation. But golf is a want. Now I say that because golf can be one of the most expensive hobbies. It can be. And I, I want to put myself on the platform, and I'll tell you, that's why. The question I ask myself is, I'm, am I investing as much in the kingdom of God? I should be, I mean, you should be investing tenfold as I so easily part with money for a dozen of the best golf balls or for a new drive, whatever it is. See, though, golf is not a sin. It's not immoral. It's a recreation. It depends on what place it has in my life. And you have to ask that same thing about the clothing you wear, about the memberships you have, about the car you drive, all of it. That's my question to each of you. What are you doing with your life? Eugene Peterson says, and this is the epiphany, birds have feet and can walk. Birds have claws and can grasp a branch securely. They can walk, they can cling, but they were made to fly. And until they fly, they're not thriving. They're not truly living. The grace and beauty of all of it, of all it is to be a bird is missing. What a tragedy. And so it is with humans. We can stockpile. We can hoard. We can latch on and cling to our wealth. But we were made to be generous. And until we are, we will not know what it is to be human. The grace and beauty of all it is to be us is missing. Now, <clears throat> Enjoy your life, but not to the exclusion of your calling. And so here's my action points for you that I never get to give. It's simple. Number one, don't walk out of here and say, man, that was a great sermon. Boy, I'm convicted and do nothing. Get a budget. 
sit down with a financial advisor and count the cost and say, I want to give a 10%. I want to give the first fruits to God. Therefore, I'm going to do a budget. And then I know how much I can spend on other things because this is what I'm giving to the kingdom of God. So that when I die, I've invested the very best of what all God has given me into something that really matters. If you walk out of here and don't do a budget, you'll never do it. I know that because I've lived it. Get a budget. And then the peace of mind you're going to have when you know there's a plan and you're giving God what belongs to God is going to be out of this world. Amen. Second, distinguish between wants and needs. And if your wants are keeping you from tithing, sacrifice your wants for the sake of other people's needs. You got it? Because Jesus himself said it is very difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. Budget. Distinguish between wants and needs and then receive the blessings that come. Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Now, see, here's the deal. Okay, man, I love being old. I love being old. I do. Because uh, here's what congregations think when a pastor talks about this. Oh, my goodness, another pastor trying to manipulate me into giving. Is that what you think I'm doing? Then you're right. <laughs> Absolutely. I've tried all the other things. Oh, I just want to be nice to you, and you should give because this is a great vision. <laughs> you better give because the Bible say, okay. Transparency. This is the epiphany. This is the best way to live life. It's the, it's, it is the best way to live life. And the Bible says, I don't know of any other way to say it, that when you honor God with this, the, the, the windows of heaven open and he pours out his blessing on you. I don't know what it's going to be. I wish I could tell you every dollar you give God, he's going to give you 10. That's not the way it works. If I believe that, I would give everybody a dollar when they came in the door to church every weekend. <laughs> I, I don't, that's, that's up to God. I just know that that is the truth of scripture. Now, just quickly, can I ask you something? Has God been good to you? Come on. Come on. How do you, man, he, you, you know, when you die, you're going to go to heaven and you're going to live in eternity with God. And it's going to be so awesome that the deepest words of the apostle Paul and the revelator John and it just can't come close to what you and I have to look forward to and what, what God has provided for us. And this, this life, man, I'm 60 this year. And, I, you know, where did life go? Where did it go? And they say the older you get, the faster it goes. Yeah. But I'm okay with that now. I'm, I'm okay with that. I've made my peace with that. Going to be with Jesus. Going to be with my mom. Going to be with my dad. Primarily going to be with Jesus. He's taking care of you. Stop worrying so much about aging. Stop worrying so much about how you feel. Stop worrying about that. Don't, don't focus on you. That's another distraction. Distraction. Focus on the time you have left and what you can do in the kingdom of God while enjoying the pleasures of life that God has given you. Give him the first fruits. Father, thank you for... Oh, you've been so good to us. It's amazing what you've done and what you've given. And sometimes how we forget it is embarrassing. And you put up with us. You tolerate so much of what we do in our attitudes, but you still love us. That nothing can separate us from your love. That he who did not spare his own son will surely give us and does give us all good things. Open our eyes this weekend. We are the rich ones who have been commanded to be holy, to be generous and sacrificial. For the sake of the city and bringing people far from God near. In Christ's name, now everybody said, Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me wonder.
today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.